Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Sam. I am an alcoholic. Hey, Sam. Hearing all these wonderful things that have been said about me tonight, uh, I wish were true. But, uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for asking me to be here. It's quite an honor. And uh, when, uh, when I got the phone call, if, if you have any complaints after we finish, stand up. Yeah. <laughs> There's the reason right there. Uh, he gave me a call, and before I realized that I'd, that I'd said it, I said I'd, I would. I haven't slept a night since. <laughs> My sobriety date is September the 3rd, 1982. And uh, there's, there's another person. I'm, I can't believe the crowd that's here tonight. Um, this is supposed to be about a, an intimate crowd of about 20 people. That's what I was told, anyway. Uh, but there's somebody in this room that, that I met. Uh, I could say my sobriety date September the 3rd, 1982. And around that date, I met Jenny. Stand up, Jenny. So we're classmates. Uh, I was thrilled to death to see you tonight. Huge Jenny and I, we stayed in treatment. Uh, back then, if you had any other exotic uh, drugs, you were there 42 days. And if it was just alcohol, I believe 28 days was, was the norm. I had a little more than that. Uh, <laughs> but Jenny and I stayed in touch and went to meetings together and went back to the treatment center where we for uh, several years after that. And so so good to see you tonight, you and Harold both. Uh, I want to thank, I think I want to thank, but uh, thank you anyway for the, for the wonderful turnout tonight. Uh, I see so many people in here that I know, and uh, it just it gives me a great feeling to stand up here and, and look out there. It gives me a... Uh, I hope uh, when you leave here, maybe the thing that was read earlier tonight about hope you get something for the, from the speaker that may may keep you sober one day. If fear will do it. Uh, maybe my story will frighten you so damn bad you'll get to immediately call the sponsor. But like I say, uh, I was I was born in a very small town out west of here at the time that I was. That I grew up there, it was a lot smaller than it is now, a little town called Villa Rica. And it's out west, almost to the Alabama line. My mother taught school. And uh, my mom and dad lived in Tampa, Florida, or lived right outside Tampa. And uh, when mom got pregnant, she came back to Villa Rica. And my dad saw the story and went that had borrowed some money from my granddaddy and uh, about $2,000 and in 1938, $2,000 was a hell of a lot of money. And my, he had made no attempt to pay my granddaddy back. And when my mom left, she said, when you pay, pay daddy back, I'll come back. So he never made an attempt to pay it back and later on they got divorced. And uh, I saw my dad two times, I think. He came to see me when I was, put your hand over your heart, when I was at Auburn. Auburn. (laughs) (laughs) Some smart remark coming from over here. No wonder I drank. (laughs) We've had some good years and bad, but uh, anyway, let's get on with my story. Uh, I grew up there in that small town. I was always interested in athletics. And uh, my mom coached girls basketball, and she won the state championship, I think, like three times. I think I was born five foot five, 
uh, I, I ne never grew much, and <laughs> basketball was not a strong suit for me. <laughs> but I was, I ran, I played football out of fear, and uh, I weighed about 150 pounds, 155, but I was, I was fast. I was real fast, and I played. I played football during high school and then went off to college and played two years until I tore my knee up and transferred to Auburn. And that's where I finished school. But uh, all my life, it seemed like I've, I just... And, and you've heard so many speakers stand up here and say, I felt different. I just never really felt like I belonged. I didn't... I, you know, I had every opportunity in the world. I, my dad and mom divorced, so uh, I, I didn't have a daddy. I had an uncle that kind of adopted me until he had a son, and that changed, that relationship changed some, but uh, I never really felt like I belonged. Now, I've heard speakers stand up here and talk about when they took their first drink. Well, I waited as long as I could. I was six. <laughs> uh, and I don't know why I remember all these things, but I remember I found a quart fruit jar of wine in an aunt's kitchen. And I remember I was six years old. And I had, had heard some things about drinking since my daddy did a lot of that. And uh, I, But I took two swallows out of that quart fruit jar of homemade muscadine wine. And that's what I found in that in that closet and it changed my life I remember that warm feeling I remember that what it tastes like going down and I remember sitting there two weeks later when I drank that entire bottle up I'd go back to it every day and take a drink or two out of it took me about two weeks and uh, I remember saying I'll do this every opportunity I get for the rest of my life and I about pulled it off I've asked my wife and uh, several people, if they remember the first drink they ever took, and they look at me like a blind wall to drink of what? You know, just uh, <laughs> they don't drink, you know. Do you remember the first drink? Uh, yeah, I remember everything about it. It was 10 o'clock in the morning, and, and I found that quart fruit jar, and, and uh, it was in my aunt's kitchen cabinet, and I remember everything about it. And I remember the disappointment I had when I realized that uh, it was all gone and I wasn't going to get any more. And I didn't, but I don't think a day passed from then up till I was a teenager when I could start drinking more. I, did, I was really heavy into athletics. And I didn't drink at all, even in high school, during, uh, during football season or track season. I didn't, I didn't just cut it off. I didn't drink. And then I didn't drink alcoholically. I just drank sporadically out during the rest of high school and a couple of years in college until I transferred to Auburn. And uh, there was some places around Auburn that was close to a fraternity house where I belonged. One was the War Eagle, one was the Plainsman, and one was Pop Rain's Beverage Shack. <laughs> I frequented Pop Rain's Beverage Shack a lot. Uh, back then, the only thing you could get, unless you went to a state store in Alabama, was beer. But we drank a lot of beer. We drank a lot. I, I drank a lot in, in the fraternity that I joined. Uh, but none of the none of the ugliness. It was a long time before my drinking really interfered with my life. Uh, like I said earlier, my granddaddy owned this bank in in Villa Rica. And th they made plans, I think, from the day I was born that I would go to school and major in money and banking, which I did. Come home and uh, get a job at the bank and eventually take the bank over and run it. And that's what I did. Now, the bank back then... Banks had different hours than they've got now. We closed every day at 2.30 and uh, didn't open on Saturday. So it left a lot of free time. I, uh, I bird hunted a lot. 
I had kept bird dogs, and when I'd get off at 2.30 in the afternoon, I'd get my bird dogs, and I would go bird hunting. We just, I lived out on the edge of town. I'd try to open the gate, and the dogs would run out, and I'd be bird hunting. And uh, I did that for quite a while. Then uh, a friend of mine played golf, and uh, there was a foursome that played every week. One of them was in a car wreck. So they came over to the house one Wednesday morning, and I was getting ready to go bird hunting. And they said, uh, we want you to go play golf. And I said, when I get to I'm old that I can't do anything else, I might take up golf. But that is not <laughs> something I want to do right now. I said, you go into the golf course. Well, being the little alcoholic or the drug addict that I am, I played golf on Wednesday. On Friday, I bought a set of clubs. And uh, I played golf until my eyes got bad. But uh, the bird dogs had to go. The uh, bird dogs went, the, everything else. I just became obsessed over, over golf. And I played every day. Just that uh, everything I've ever done, I seem to run in the ground. But I could, another thing about golf is, is you can get up it. Seven eight o'clock on Wednesday morning, and you go into the golf course. You can start drinking, and people won't look at you funny. And you know, if if you're drinking, if you got a shotgun in your hand and you're drinking, they, <laughs> they look at you a little funny. But um, if you got a golf club in your hand and you're out at the golf course, uh, pretty much that's a, that's a, what everybody does. And uh, I got pretty good at it. I, I had a little old handicap and uh, and that's what I did for years until my until my eyes got bad but the drinking over the years increased and uh, I remember I got alcohol for me I also suffered from something somebody was talking earlier in the, in the meeting I was treated in uh, I went into treatment in 1990, 1989, I believe, 1982, for alcoholism. And uh, I had to go back into treatment in 87, 88 for a clinical depression. Now, uh, we were talking earlier, and if I had to go back, to, if I had to go back to either one of these problems, and there may be somebody in this room that suffers from one or both of these things. If I had to go back to drinking or I had to go back to the, to the depression, I believe I would, I would take the drinking. Uh, that depression is something that um, it just ate my lunch. I went to, uh, I had a sponsor that was a doctor out in Dalton, and he got me, uh, I went up to visit him when, in the midst of that depression, and he said, why don't you just stay with me a few days? And I was working at a treatment center at, uh, back here in Smyrna, just uh, as, to coordinate a pro, an aftercare. I, wanted, I was an aftercare counselor. We, uh, back then, we had a professional program where we treated doctors and nurses and professional people. And then we had a smaller program made up of what we called the real people, and, and that was people like, that weren't doctors and medical people and uh, I took that over and we started an aftercare program there but uh, I knew damn well I was going to forget where I was <laughs> um, we started that aftercare program for the for the real people and I was talking to somebody tonight and I understand that it's still going on and that's been a great thing for that hospital, I think, that uh, something that we started so long ago. And I saw a guy in here just a minute ago. Stand up, Tom. Where'd Tom go? <laughs> he was one of the originals to that, to that group of people a long time ago that started an aftercare program and in a, in an alumni program for people at Ridgeview that go through that that uh, hospital and it's still still there so I want to thank Tom for that 
uh, back to my drinking, it uh, it got bad people. It uh, somewhere I read I had to go get a driver's license, and and I still shake, and and that came from I think that still still around because of I was a shaking drunk. I knocked down near knocked half a tooth off one day. I was coming up with a bottle I can and got right there and I gave a jerk. <laughs> and knocked half that tooth. That's a, a fake tooth right there. <laughs> knocked myself in the mouth with that bottle and uh, broke half that tooth off. But uh, I'd, I'd wake up in the morning and I know I'd come to in the morning. It started like I'd, I'd read somewhere a hair of the dog, and I'd wake up and I'd be sick. And I'd, I discovered that I could take a drink or two in the morning before I went to work. And got, you can't smell vodka. <laughs> I was wondering if that was going to get a laugh. <laughs> if any of you little pre-drunks are thinking about, well, I'm on, I just drank vodka, can't anybody tell it? Yeah, you can, too. <laughs> that stuff's awful. But uh, I, I didn't think you could, so I'd wake up in the morning and I'd be sick. And, uh, I was still working at the bank. But I I kept a quarter, half gallon, I mean, I kept a half gallon of vodka in the trunk of my car. And I kept a quarter in my desk. I mean, this is a, a long progression before it got this bad. Usually, I'd, I mean, as it started earlier, I'd leave the bank. But I, I, I got where I couldn't even hold a pen until I'd had a, had a drink or two. Couldn't sign my name. And the other solution to that? have a signature stamp made. <laughs> and that's what I did. People would bring paper in the bank for me to sign, I have deeds or whatever. I'd reach in there and get my pad out and stamp the pad and stamp it with my signature stamp. So we do get creative. But it began to get worse and worse. And uh, I began to keep it, like I say, I kept it at the bank. And uh, it came down to a point where I was, uh, some of you may know my wife, but I was sitting in the bank one day minding my own business, and uh, this woman walked in the bank, and uh, she asked for the executive officer, and uh, they came and got me, and she interviewed for a job. Well, we needed somebody like her. Needed somebody exactly like her. <laughs> so I hired her. And I was married, and she was married, and today she and I have been married 30 years. So <laughs> I won't go into all those lurid details. Uh, that's the story of, of that relationship <laughs> and hopefully we'll be married another 30 years but uh, she's she's my best friend and uh, that was a uh, that was a lot of talk around Villa Record had about 2,500 people at the time and that was she happened to be married to the city judge <laughs> uh, <laughs> I happened to be married to a school teacher, but um, word got around. <laughs> and uh, somebody called me one day and told me something that uh, I had told Charlotte. And I thought the only way they found out is Charlotte told them. So I broke that relationship off for about three years. And I saw her down at the golf course one day. And the next day I called him, but I found out that uh, that one what happened that it, it was leaked by another another friend of mine, and uh, so she and I dated for about eight years. You don't want to rush into anything. <laughs> she got divorced, I got divorced, and we married in '89, uh, and we've been married ever since. So. That's probably, after getting sober, is, is one of the, the 
most life-changing events in my life. And one of the things that I value more than anything, that uh, this is a relationship unlike anything. We're just as, we're best friends. And she played golf and I played golf. And before my eyes got bad, we played golf a lot together. We played golf before we got married. We'd take trips and go off and play. So I've had a had a pretty storied life. The uh, thing about your granddaddy owning a bank, they tend to want to meddle in your business. So they called a they called a board meeting. They uh, I had a like I said earlier, I had a half gallon of vodka in, in the trunk of my car, and uh, I kept some in my office. But uh, when I really wanted to do some serious, we kept the bank open till five. Six o'clock on Fridays. Well, I ran out of steam long before six o'clock came, and I'd have to go out and get get snort out of that vodka bottle. And I remember I got caught one time by the janitor, and he couldn't wait to get in and, and tell the chairman of the board. And uh, they called me in, and I told them that the bank was closed when I went out there to my car. And what I did outside the bank, Stores when the bank was closed on that damn business. It was my business. And they informed me that if I intended to stay employed at that bank, my drinking had to stop. Well, I showed them, by God, I quit. I threw the, <laughs> threw the keys down on the desk, and I walked out. And after about three days, I decided, you know, maybe I acted a bit hesitantly. Maybe I, I don't. I'll give him another chance. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's exactly what they did. I walked back in there and I, I went to see the chairman of the board and I told him I'd reconsidered and I was ready to go back to work. And he said, we're going to watch you for about 30 days. And if you can go 30 days for that drinking, we may take you back. Well, now you got a drunk with a resentment. <laughs> and I thought, there's been another bank come to town uh, a couple of years before, and we had done everything we could in the bank that I worked for to keep them out. We didn't want the competition, and eventually we lost the thing, and the city approved them, and they came to town. And I said, what would be better than me get a job at that bank? So I went down there and then called the chairman of the board and went out to lunch with him, and I said, now you might have heard that I got a slight drinking problem. But I hadn't had a drink in 13 days. And it had been 13 long days. <laughs> I hadn't had a drink in 13 days. And he said something that was amusing to my ears. He said, I don't give a damn what you do as long as you do your job. So I went to work with the bank, the bank competition. And that went over really well with my uncle and the rest of my family. They, <laughs> they, uh, they practically disowned me. Well, they disowned me. You know, my drinking and everything else that was involved in it. Uh, I worked there until the drinking got so bad that uh, I decided to take a week off. And uh, when I went back, I put the key in the bank lock, and my key didn't work. They changed the locks and didn't tell me. And uh, that's how I got the word that I didn't have a job at that bank anymore. So that was uh, that was in the spring. Well, I didn't do anything until it was about oh late late summer, and uh, I was playing golf till it just got so bad that uh, I couldn't play anymore. I just stayed home and drank. That's just what I did. And uh, I'd leave and go to the liquor store and buy $100 worth of booze and bring it home and drink it up and go back and do it again. I had a daughter that uh, I forgot about talking about Kim, but uh, she uh, she was raised in a home with a, with a wet drunk. And uh, she uh, her last words to me were, Stay the hell out of my life. And after I got sober, I tried to mend that relationship, but I've so far been unable to do it. Uh, 
I was sober when I contacted her, but um, she had grown up in a in an alcoholic home where I'm sure there's some folks in this room can identify. But uh, we don't that relationship has uh, has never come back. That uh, maybe someday I I pretty well given up on it, but someday. You know, I I never did anything, but she couldn't depend on me. Now I never was a good daddy anyway. I thought I was raised in a in a house where I didn't have a daddy, so I didn't know I didn't have any feelings one way or the other. I thought if I brought in the money, then I had done my responsibility, and that's all that that I needed to do is take care of them financially, and that's what I did. But as far as giving of myself to my daughter. Never did, so that was not a great loss for her. But she's got two little boys. No, no, they're not little boys anymore. My daughter's fifty-two, I believe. And these kids are these kids. They're in their late twenties. And uh, I would like to, at some point, maybe try to look, um, form a relationship with them, but. All indications, that's just one of the things that I've, I've lost in, in my addiction. Now, I, my wife and I divorced, and I know that doesn't come as a shock to you, but uh, we divorced, and uh, I was sitting in my bank one day, and I think I told you this, but uh, I saw this woman walk down the street, and I said, hmm. I think I'll see where she's going. She walked down the street and walked in this restaurant. So I walked in the restaurant. She was sitting back there with with this county judge. I've come to find out she was married to the county judge and uh, the city judge. And uh, I went down and sat down with her and uh, sat out with them. And uh, we became good friends. And later on, I was to hire her. An opening for the bank came in, came open, and and she applied for the job. And nothing untoward had gone on at that point. It was just that um, we were friends for the record, small town. Everybody knew each other, and we socialized together. But uh, she was an exceptionally good golfer, and uh, I played a lot of golf, so we began to play golf together in that relationship begin to change hands. I mean, it began to do things that neither one of us had planned for. So eventually, uh, my wife and I decided that she'd had enough of me, and we divorced. And later on, she was to develop cancer. And she had it, and they treated her for it, and it went into remission. And then in about five years, it came back. And that time, they couldn't do anything, and, and she passed away. Now, Charlotte and I, like I said, she and I have been married 30 years. And uh, my daughter, I called my daughter to tell her that we, that she and I were going to get married. And... We'd been seeing each other while we were while we were still married to other people. My daughter knew that, and she thought that I was just led astray by that woman. <laughs> and she said, "You're picking that woman over me." And I said, "I didn't call you to get you uh, get your permission. I called you because you deserved to hear it." So that's when she told me to stay the hell out of her life. Yeah, I've never been able to repair that. So I see, you know, I could say there's a chance in the future that it may change, but I don't see it see it happening. Uh, worked at Ridgeview. As soon as I got out of treatment, I, I didn't do anything for about two years. And then I applied. There was a little treatment center that... Uh, some employees at Lockheed was, had put together to treat patients that had a drinking problem that worked for Lockheed. 
and it's called Advanced Recovery Systems. And I didn't do anything but go to meetings and hang out with drunks. That's the only people I cared about being around. If I played golf, I played golf with people in recovery. If I went out to eat, I went out to eat with people in recovery. And uh, that's the only people that I cared about being with. So when the, uh, that uh, job opening came up at uh, Lockheed, we formed a little company and were treating their employees. Back then, I think they had about five or 10,000 employees. So any given time, we had about 35 or 40 patients in treatment. And it, it wasn't, you know, it was, it was just basic stuff. We'd go to, we'd have a group in the morning, we'd have a lecture right after lunch. We'd go to meetings every day, every day. So by the time the patients got through the treatment, they had their 90 meetings in 90 days, about a 90-day program. And it's amazing how many patients, you know, I think sometimes we get sober in spite of treatment. But this program that we developed, it was, we didn't know anything but AA. I mean, NA and AA. All we knew was a 12-step program. So if you went through our program, you had a sponsor. You had gone through the steps. We uh, we just ate, slept, and drank. AA, and uh, and a lot of people got sober in that little program. Uh, later on, AG came in and bought us, and things things began to change. But uh, I understand now that from talking to Eddie, that things are a lot of things are back like they used to be, and uh, some some things aren't, but. Uh, Thanks to Eddie, uh, I couldn't have picked anybody if, to take my job. I couldn't have picked anybody better than than Eddie. I've been so grateful that Ridgeview and its wisdom and Eddie and his expertise and dedication have have brought about. A, Eddie's doing things that I didn't even think about doing when I was there, and very positive things. And I want to thank you for that, for keeping that program going. Uh, I haven't, I retired two years ago, and some of you, a lot of you that are here tonight attended my surprise party. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of sniggering and giggling going on about that. I was, somebody told me that uh, I need to be over at Ridgeview about 6 o'clock on a Friday afternoon for something. And I think my wife knew about it. And it was about 4 o'clock, one, four or 5 o'clock. And I showed up, and about 200 other people showed up about the same time. <laughs> and they gave me a, uh, a party. And back when I was there, we uh, bought a piece of land. We had Ridgeview owned it. We got it. We got it deeded to us. And we called it the Serenity Garden. And we'd have fundraisers and put money into that serenity garden. We built a fountain, and that fountain's still there. And we built a lot of, if, if you get a chance and you're over at Ridgeview, go by that serenity garden and you'll see it. There's not a dime of Ridgeview money in that garden. And it's one of the nicest, nicest things that uh, I think about Ridgeview. It's a labor of love that built that thing. But they also added uh, a walkway up to a little podium up on top of the garden. And uh, people go sit up there and they go up, sponsors take their folks over there and go through step work with them. And it's just a, it's a neat thing. The one thing I think that, and this is kind of a plug for Ridgeview, the one thing that set Ridgeview aside as long as I was there, and I, I feel pretty, pretty sure that it's the same way now, that always AA was supported. You know, we had, uh, we had a, when I went there, Ridgeview primarily, like, like I said, Ridgeview was a, uh, primarily a professional program. And, uh, there wasn't any aftercare for real people. 
So we started an aftercare group on Monday, and I heard from Treva that aftercare group's still going. Uh, then Monday we added one, I think, on Tuesday and maybe Wednesday and Thursday. I, when are they after care? Monday, Monday night, Thursday night. Yeah. And uh, there's no additional cost for that. That's uh, We recommend people come for two years. And a lot of people have gotten, you know, it, it, it was kind of tough on me. And I know a lot of people that went through treatment back when Jenny and I did, that you stayed in treatment 28 days. Uh, Jenny was a lot sicker than I was. She stayed 42. Um, uh, you, and, and that was pretty much it. But, uh, you know, you stay in treatment. It's a cloister time. You get out, and then they say, here's your aftercare plan. Don't drink and go to meetings. And it's good that the hospital now has has something for the patients to come back to. Uh, the relationships are met. Uh, I still, well, like Jenny tonight, I hadn't seen her in years. But we talked about things that uh, happened 37 years ago. 37 years ago, yeah. So we make relationships like that. And then AA that are different. My wife and I are, are so close. But there's a place she can't go. And I can walk up to somebody in a meeting like this tonight. And like Jerry and I talking in the car, coming out here tonight, there's a bond and, and that, that uh, people that just haven't been there don't get it. They just... And they're not at fault. They just don't get it. And I still, like I said, I go to three or four meetings a week. And uh, after even after 37 years, I look forward to it. Uh, I go to a meeting on Saturday morning. And it's about, I saw some folks in here that I know from that meeting. There's about 75 or 80 guys meet on Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. Can you imagine a bunch of damn drunks getting up on Saturday morning at 9 o'clock Saturday morning after laying out all night? But uh, it's a good meeting. It's a really good meeting, and uh, I look forward to it every week. But I've, uh, I think we pay a heck of a dues to get here. Uh, I wouldn't take anything for the life that I've got now. I don't want to go back and repeat it. And somebody a lot wiser than myself said to forget is to be condemned to repeat. I need to remember just how, how bad it was. And uh, I don't want to go back. And I see so many people, uh, not so much now, but when I was, when I was in working for the hospital, I see so many people come to, come to treatment, get out, and drop out of the program, and they relapse. And I, I, I don't I don't get it. I don't know why that is. But uh, I guess maybe we forget where we came from. Now I don't sit around in meetings and talk about. I don't go to meetings where all you want to talk about is getting drunk and all that kind of stuff. But. Uh, I go to meetings when we talk about recovery, and uh, I see some people in my home group that are here tonight, and it's such a good thing to see them and be with them tonight. But uh, we meet on Tuesday night, and we're always there. It's about 35, 40 of us that always are in there on Tuesday night. And it sure is good to see you folks here tonight. Uh, I don't know what big mouth. I think Jerry's the instigator of all this stuff. Eddie. Yeah, now we're getting in on this, on this whole damn front row. But um, I do want to thank. I haven't looked at my watch, and I don't know if I've been up here 10 minutes or 10 minutes. No, you're good. Whatever. 
Okay. Uh, I want to thank everybody being here tonight. I know you didn't all come to see me. Thank God. And I know you didn't all come to hear me yap and tell my story. Thank God. Most of you have been around already know my dang story. And uh, it brings tears to my eyes, I guarantee you. But uh, it's kind of, so far, has a good ending. And it, it means so much. I mean, where else would you see a group like this on Friday night? I'd come up with a bunch of different excuses to show up anywhere. And people have come a long way. Some people have come a long way to be here tonight. I want to thank people, too, that this is your home group. That table back there is just full of food. And this one right here is, stand up, Trevor. <laughs> All that chocolate back there. Yeah, all the chocolate. Here's another one right here. So, thanks everybody for being here tonight. And, uh, you know, I, I love you all and respect you all. And if there's any, I'm in the book. And uh, anybody that needs me, I'd be glad to give you my phone number. Uh, anything I can do for anybody in this room, uh, I'd be more than happy to do. So thank you for being here, and thank you for listening to me out for 35, 40 minutes. Well, thanks, thanks God. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.